If there's any kind of magic in this world, it must be in the attempt of understanding someone sharing something. what that was but we're just gonna stick with it why well why ever not i am mal foster and you are you looking absolutely foxy in that face mask i just want to take a second Oof. yeah that's right senpai i have in fact noticed you it's hard not to when you're wearing that foxy face mask and i know that you have been wearing it i know for certain there are not many things in life that are certain they say death Taxes, I say neuroticism, and queues in supermarkets, they're all certain. And you know what else is going to be added to that list? The fact that you have been wearing your face mask in public. You know why? You know why I know this is a certainty? Because people that listen to this show, yes, they have questionable taste in podcasts, but they also possess logic. I also happen to know that you guys also possess a great sense of a rare commodity in 2020, and that is empathy. Yeah, because outside of common sense and just general intelligence, I know that you guys actually give a shit about yourself, about your friends, your families, your neighbours, everyone around you, and just basically human beings in general. So I know that you've been wearing that face mask, and I know that you've been wearing it like nobody else. Before we get into this episode properly, I just want to say that right now, at the time of recording, it is June 30th. And despite us about to roll over into July, and by the time this episode comes out, it will be July, um, it is June 30th, it is the last day of Pride Month, and I want to say that if you've been celebrating Pride Month, to any of my listeners who are in the LGBTQ plus community, I hope that amongst all of this ugliness, all of this nastiness, all of the redundancy that is just swirling around this giant vacuum of what the fudge, I hope that you have managed to get as much joy and celebration out of this Pride Month that you deserve. With us having just passed the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, um, I decided to jump into it and learn a bit more about it, because I knew a little bit about Stonewall, but I didn't know that much. And, you know, the, the cornerstone of growth, of getting better as individuals, as a community, as a nation, as a society and a species is... Learning is educating. It's education and empathy. So jumping into the first of those two E's, I have just been digging into the archives, learning more about Stonewall, what happened on those nights, and more importantly, what happened afterwards, what unfolded after, how the gay liberation movement unfolded and progressed and evolved and pushed forward to where it is now. And honestly, it's been really interesting. I still have a lot to learn and a lot to discover and a lot to find out. But honestly, jumping in and getting more education on it, learning more about the legacy and the impact, it's been genuinely fantastic. It's been fantastic to find out more and to just read about a huge triumph in human history. Because that's what it is. It's a triumph in human history. And the further it progresses, the further it moves, the more work it does, the more it's going to make more milestones, more historic chapters in this story. So yeah, if you've been celebrating Pride Month, I hope, as I said at the top there, as as ugly as things are right now, as crazy as things are still, I hope that you've managed to squeeze as much joy and as much celebration out of June as you possibly can. As I said a little bit earlier, I am recording this on the 30th of June. By the time the episode drops and the time that you are probably going to be hearing this, it is going to be the 2nd of July. Now, Initially, I did actually want to schedule it for this Saturday, two days after its initial drop, but I changed my mind. I mean, no doubt many of you have just recently learned that this Saturday marks the anniversary of a historic date. One that, if I'm being perfectly honest, more people in this country need to know about. I mean, come on guys, let's be honest. Until I moved the episode, nobody had heard of it. You know, and I don't want to toot my own horn here. (laughs) 
but honestly, you know, by moving the episode back to its original date till Thursday the 2nd of July, I have made the 4th of July very famous. So, I guess what I'm saying is, you're welcome, America. Now, hopefully you've managed to get this episode okay, because... Goodness knows, the demand is going to be off the rails, it's going to be off the hook. I am expecting max capacity on the bandwidth for this one. I'm expecting this sucker to just, just blow up. I'm expecting the most beautiful, biggest, bestest, fastest, most populated downloads and streams a party has ever had. It's going to be full to capacity. It's going to be a full house. It's going to be more full house than any bingo hall from here to anywhere. Um... <laughs> Essentially, it's it's going to be packed. So hopefully you got your download in early because otherwise, not a chance. Because it's going to break the internet, lads. This one, it's it's going to be colossal. Kim Kardashian's ass has got nothing on this episode. In all seriousness, this episode is actually going to be released for the 4th of July week weekend. But we're not going to be celebrating America with this episode. No? No, I hate to dissolve some people <laughs> with disappointment. Uh, but we're not, uh, because, well, let's be honest, why would I? Instead, what we are going to be doing is celebrating some truly instrumental Americans. Genuinely instrumental Americans. Today, we're going to be diving into the history books. We're going to be celebrating the life, the work, and the innovations of eight African-American inventors of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. That's right, I'm going to be talking about eight innovators in particular. Four male, four females, There's going to be a couple of honourable mentions, but as a whole we're going to be looking at eight condensed biographies of people who really made significant changes to everyday life, to the fields of science, medicine and technology. People that you may very well be aware of, but then again, you may not be. I certainly wasn't, and by doing this, I've not only learnt more, but I've opened up a doorway into further investigation. I have had a blast putting this episode together. I have learned so much, and hopefully the aim is that you guys will enjoy it, but you'll also get something from it too. If you want to dig deeper into some of the rabbit holes that we're going to be digging here, into some of the timelines that we're going to be exploring, some of the people we're going to be talking about, if you want to dig deeper, then please, I absolutely encourage you to do so. What I'm going to do is... To give you a little bit of a jumping point, if you don't know where to start, what I'm going to do, and also just because I think it's the right and fair thing to do, is I'm going to name check the reference points that I've used at the end of the episode, and furthermore, if you want to jump into it and do a bit of online digging, if you go to our website, which is dimed-out.com, go to the show notes for this episode, there will be hyperlinks in there for you to go to these resources directly and just dig through, learn about some of the people we're talking about, or maybe learn about some of their contemporaries or other people within similar fields. So yeah, I want to open those up for you guys to use if you want to, and, and hopefully you do. Hopefully this encourages you to go and do some digging of your own. But for the meantime, I'm not going to waste any more time. We're going to jump straight into it. We're going to look at eight pioneers, eight significant contributors to modern life in a variety of different ways. Eight innovators of African-American descent who have changed the game in one way or another for the better. People that, as I said, you may be familiar with, people you may not be. Either way, I hope you get something out of it. I hope you enjoy. And uh, yeah, let's not waste any more time. Let's get into it. Let's take a look at some real pioneers. Let's take a look at some African-American inventors and innovators of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. All right, so we begin our journey back in... 1844, 2nd of May to be precise, with the birth of Elijah the Real McCoy. Elijah was born in Colchester, Ontario, Canada, to George and Mildred, who, at the time, were fugitive slaves that had escaped from Kentucky and moved to Canada via helpers in the Underground Railroad. In 1847, Elijah and his family moved back to the US, settling in Michigan. At age 15, Elijah was sent to Edinburgh, Scotland for an apprenticeship in mechanical engineering, upon which, successfully becoming a certified mechanical engineer, Elijah returned back to the US. 
but due to racial barriers, skilled professional positions were not available for African Americans at the time, regardless of their training or background. Elijah did get himself a position as the fireman and oiler for the Michigan Central Railroad, and it was in this line of work that he developed his first major inventions. In particular, an automatic lubricator for oiling steam engines of locomotives and ships. It was known as the Oil Drip Cup, and in 1872 Elijah obtained a patent for the invention, which allowed trains to run continuously for long periods of time without pausing for maintenance. Now I know what you might be thinking, looking at that through a contemporary lens, putting that in the viewfinder of 2020, of modern day technology, you might think, eh, so what? But really, back then, that would have been a huge thing, a massive game changer, not just in terms of public transport, but particularly in terms of commerce and industry and economy, because back then, getting goods from one place to another was primarily done by trains. So if you can cut down on maintenance time, and you can just make the overall well-being of your transport better, then you are going to get faster deliveries, you're going to get more deliveries, more reliable deliveries, and you are going to see a general uptick in terms of commerce and economy. Within 10 years, Elijah's device was so successful that buyers of steam trains and steam engines used in mines and factories would ask if the lubrication systems were, yep, you guessed it, the real McCoy. Throughout his lifetime, Elijah held 57 US patents, one of which was for a folding ironing board, one of which was for a lawn sprinkler, both incredibly important items at different times, and I guess still, if you have a lawn, you are probably very grateful for the lawn sprinkler, but it is the lubrication patents, it is his work in terms of pushing forward maintenance for trains, for pushing forward the idea of, of engineering preservation, and the expansion of, of commerce and economy and civilization, really, because it is, it boils down to that. By keeping trains healthy back then, you were not only keeping public transport healthy, you were keeping economy healthy, you know. It, as I said, it may not seem like a big thing now, but in terms of the big picture, something like that, cutting down on time and inconvenience and helping progress the lifeblood of Civilization, transport, commerce, deliveries, huge, huge thing. And uh, yeah, just a huge, huge contribution in terms of the big picture from Elijah McCoy. Keeping within the train industry for just a moment or two, we move on to our second inventor, and that is Granville T. Woods. The T, if you're wondering, stands for Taylor. Granville was born the 23rd of April, great month to be born, just saying, 1856 in Columbus, Ohio. Granville attended school until about the age of 10, when due to his family's financial situation, he had to leave education, and in doing so, he began to serve an apprenticeship in a machine shop, where he learned the trades of machinist and blacksmith. At the age of 16, Granville became a fireman on the Danville and Southern Railroad in Missouri. Just think of that for a second, imagine yourself at 16, I'm sure you were very well adjusted, I'm sure you were actually a really good 16 year old, but me, personally speaking, yeah, I cannot imagine having that job at 16. I I would have probably accidentally caused a fire at 16 instead of preventing them or putting them out. So automatically, hypothetical hats off to the 16-year-old Granville T. Woods for doing that. Yeah. Four years later, Granville found himself in New York City where he was studying engineering and electricity. Once he'd finished his education, he returned back to Ohio in 1878, where he began to work for the Springfield, Jackson and Pomeroy Railroad Company. Following this, he began to work as an engineer for the Dayton and Southeastern Railway Company. And it was in this two-year period upon returning from New York that Granville really began to form ideas that would eventually lead to his most famous and groundbreaking inventions. Now, it's probably worth mentioning at this point, as I approach a pretty difficult word, there are going to be things here that I just really, really mispronounce and butcher. And it's not done purposely. It's just, yeah, some of them are tricky. And this is definitely one of them. So just, just getting that out of the way. Anyway, back to where we were. 
1885, Granville T. Woods patented a device he called telegraphony? Te telegraphony. Yeah, that looks about right. Telegraphony. Doesn't sound right, but we're going to stick with that anyway. Essentially, it allowed telegraph stations to send voice and telegraph messages via Morse code through a single wire. That, by the way, was the collective set of minds being blown simultaneously back in 1885 when this technology first reared its head. Because imagine, imagine that. Imagine putting yourself back in those days and that happens. It would just be... That's right, I am actually doing my own sound effects. I would say it's because they don't have the budget for it, but it's just more fun, let's be honest. Anyway, in 1887, he pushed this idea even further when he patented the synchronous multiplex railway telegraph, which admittedly is a bit of a mouthful and it's not that snappy, but it was a game changer nonetheless. Essentially what this was is a system which allowed train stations to communicate with moving trains. Now think about that for a second. That was, that was a terrible air horn. Sorry. But seriously, think about that for a second. Outside of the major advances to the train industry, a system of communication on that level must have had a huge knock-on effect for countless other areas of communication. Countless. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked again, sorry. Thomas Edison, you know him, you know old Thomas. Apparently, old Thomas there tried twice to legally dispute Granville's claim of ownership for the patent of railway telegraph, but... With notes, sketches, and other supporting evidence, Granville T. Woods successfully defended his claim on both occasions. So after both defeats, what does Edison do? He only offers Granville a bloody job. And what does Granville T. Woods do? He declines the offer. He says no. I mean, Thomas Edison, arguably one of the most historic, iconic inventors of all time, offers you a job at his company after you beat him twice in a legal dispute, and you say, Nah, I'm good. I mean, <laughs> that's about as punk rock as you can get. I mean, to choose your independence in that situation, to have that much belief, and to bet on yourself to that degree... And with great success, by the way, because that's what happened. He did have great success. To do that, regardless of having great success, to take a chance when given that opportunity, to take a chance on yourself despite that, man, that is something to genuinely admire. So yeah, as I said, he declined and he had success. He formed the Woods Electric Company, which was based in Cincinnati. Furthermore, he would hold over 60 patents throughout his career, including the safety dimmer, which essentially is the system that controls lights in theatres, or as we now have them, movie theatres. So yeah, when it's safe to go bang to movie theatres, when we feel comfortable to go bang to movie theatres, and we see the lights dim and dim and dim until we are fully immersed and the movie's about to start, we all have a little thank you to give to Granville T. Woods for enhancing that experience. In all seriousness, the legacy of Granville T. Woods is something fantastic. That man left behind a body of work and change that is quite frankly remarkable. I mean, outside the fact that he was the first African American to become a mechanical and electrical engineer after the Civil War, which on its own is an amazing feat. And then you add to that his work and industrial contributions and how they have made a major impact on the safety, efficiency and potential of both public and trade transportation. You have a man whose history should be fondly remembered and honoured. Like, that is a hell of a life. Next, we move on to a man who was considered to be the most prominent black scientist of the early 20th century, which is a hell of a label to have put on you. Yeah, that's, that's quite, the, quite the attribute to be given. I am, of course, talking about George Washington Carver, and out of the eight people we're talking about in this episode, he is probably the one most people will be familiar with. And I want to say it's probably because he's 
often credited as being the inventor of peanut butter, which I would love to say is true, but as far as I know, it's actually not. Although he wasn't responsible for that particular beauty, he did accomplish some amazing things in his life. But before we get there, we're going to dial it back. All the way back to the start, at some point in the early or mid-1860s when George was born in Newton County, Missouri. The date of his birth is uncertain, but it was before slavery was abolished in that state. His master, Moses Carver, was a German-American immigrant who had purchased George's parents, Mary and Giles, from a man called William P. McGuinness on October the 9th, 1955, for $700. I mean... It's insane, it's mind-boggling to think that, that it, we all know it happened, but even now it's just mind-boggling to think that people actually were purchased, that people's lives were purchased, and an entire family's life was purchased for $700. It's, yeah, it doesn't matter how far away we get from it, it still doesn't make it any less sickening and just baffling as to how that was even considered okay, even in that time period, even in that social paradigm. Absolute insanity. Sickening insanity. Unfortunately, it doesn't end there. That's, that's not the end of the awfulness. When George was just one week old, he, a sister, and his mother were kidnapped by night raiders from Arkansas. His brother James managed to get away to safety. Moses Carver, the man that bought them for $700, hired someone to track down the kidnappers. But George was the only member of the family that was eventually found and returned to Carver. Yeah, I mean, what a start to life. First and foremost, you're somebody else's property. And then within a week of your own existence, you were kidnapped along with your sister and your mother, who you would never see again. You're the only person that was found and then returned back to the person that owns your life. It gets messier afterwards, because when slavery was abolished, Moses Carver and his wife Susan raised George and his brother James as if they were their own children, encouraging George to continue his intellectual pursuits and actually teaching George the basics of reading and writing. I can't even begin to enter the perimeter of that headspace, of that duality. And granted, as a child, he may not have known the full implications of his situation, but as he's gotten older and he's learnt his history more, I mean, granted, at one week old, he won't have realised what happened, but as I say, when he gets older and he learns his history and who those people really were, but yet how they helped him and looked after him, man, it's just like, what a, what a mind jam. That is. I mean, what a conflicting start to life. It's just insane. Anyway, George uh, attended segregated schools before moving to live with another foster family in Kansas and then eventually earning his diploma at Minneapolis High School in Minneapolis, Kansas, which is slightly confusing, but I guess that's a place. Well, it obviously is. Anyway, after applying to several colleges, George was eventually accepted at Highland University in Highland, Kansas. However, when he arrived, they refused to let him attend because of his race. But this didn't deter George. After this, he began to homestead a claim he had in Kansas, where he planted corn, rice, garden produce, and a variety of fruit trees. He really began to cultivate an interest which eventually led him to pursue a degree in agriculture and would have him become the very first black student at Iowa State. Whilst working towards his master's degree, George's work on plant pathology and mycology gained him national recognition and respect as a botanist. George would then go on to teach as the first black faculty member at Iowa State. In 1896, George moved over to the Tuskegee Institute, I think I'm pronouncing that right, but then again, who knows, where he became the head of the agricultural department. It was here that George taught for 47 years. He developed the department into a strong research centre whilst simultaneously teaching generations of black students farming techniques for self-sufficiency. George's methods of alternating cotton crops with plantings of things like sweet potatoes, soybeans, cowpeas and peanuts, which apparently he would go on to develop over 300 uses for, which is absolutely insane. 
how can you get 300 uses out of a peanut? But apparently, you can, because George did it. Anyway, these were not only good alternatives that were good for human consumption, but the nitrogen restored to the soil through this crop rotation helped to improve the cotton yields. So essentially, this methodology was an environmental and economical success, all wrapped up in one core idea and practice. Throughout his years of extensive research and dedicated work, George Washington Carver developed numerous techniques, inventions, and alternative uses for a variety of organic products, not just peanuts. Not only did this amplify the possibilities of black rural communities and agriculture as a whole, but his work, it helped push forward botanical science in a major way. So our fourth profiled innovator, and the last male that we're going to be featuring, is Frederick McKinley Jones. Born the 17th of May, 1893, in Cincinnati, Ohio, Frederick had a pretty rough start to life, to say the least. His mother left home when Frederick was just a small child, and his father took care of him until the age of seven. And at the age of seven, Frederick's father then passed Frederick on to live with a priest in Kentucky. Two years after this, his father died. Two years after that, at the age of 11, Frederick ran away from the priest in Kentucky to fend for himself. Again, I cannot get my head around that at any age. Uh, but 11? 11 years old, having your mother leave home, your father die, you be sent away to live with a relative stranger, and then, for some reasons, obviously, something propelled him to do so, he ran away from home and took care of himself at age 11. With minimal education to his name, Frederick returned to Cincinnati and took on a number of jobs, including working as a janitor in a garage. A garage. Yeah, oh, no. I did it. I used the Americanism in a garage. Or a garage. Whichever one you want. <laughs> Let's just go with garage. Yeah. So, Frederick gets a job in the garage, and through his own natural intuition and independent study, basically just reading everything that he could, learning all that he could, he developed a knack and understanding of cars. And at age 14, he was working as a mechanic. <laughs> completely mind-blowing, I'm going to be honest. Completely mind-blowing. And there's going to be some people listening who were probably like, yeah, I knew how to, to, to fiddle about and twiddle on with cars at that age. Uh, and I'm sure you, some of you maybe did. There are a lot of people that are just that way inclined. But to me, it's not just a case of it being mind-boggling. It's a case of being mind-blowing. Quite sincerely mind-blowing. Because as someone in his mid-thirties, I, I have no idea what I'm doing with a car. I don't know anything about cars. I know they've got gears in them. They've got bits of metal. You're supposed to put water in them from time to time. And that's about it. So... Yeah, to see a 14-year-old boy become a mechanic is... <laughs> that sums it up perfectly. The other thing is, as well, outside of it just being completely alien to me, it's really impressive. The fact that, as I said that, he went through what he went through in his childhood. He ran away at age 11, and yet he's found himself three years later working as a mechanic, having learnt how to do it. That shows a real independent and industrious spirit. It's, it's not just so much that it's mind-blowing because I know nothing about cars, and I mean nothing. It's mind-blowing because of the hardship that he went through, and the independence he found, and the, the way he pushed himself, the way he taught himself these things, and, and moved forward, and, and showed, as I said, such an independent and industrious spirit. In 1912, Frederick moved to a place called Halleck, Minnesota, where he worked as a mechanic on a 50,000-acre farm before serving in the U.S. Army during World War I. During his service, he often lent his expertise to repair machines and a variety of equipment. After the war had finished, Frederick returned back to the farm in Halleck, where he further honed his skills in electronics. When the town set up a new radio station, it was Frederick who built the transmitter required for broadcasting. And if that wasn't enough, he also invented a device that combined sound with motion pictures. 
It was this that caught the attention of local businessman Joseph Numero, who in 1930 hired Frederick to improve the sound equipment made by his firm, Cinema Supplies Incorporated. Numero would go on to sell his company to RCA and form a new company with Frederick, which in 1949 became a free million dollar business. Now, obviously, I have an obvious appreciation for Frederick's work here within the realm of sound and cinema, and I'm imagining most of you listening do. But if that's not your forte or your passion, then here is something that you really can rally behind. Around 1938, I'm putting around because I don't have an exact date here, Frederick designed a portable air cooling unit for trucks carrying perishable food. And on July the 12th, 1940, he received the patent for it. During World War II, this portable cooling unit became an integral part of the effort as they preserved not only just food, but blood and medicine for use at both army hospitals and on the battlefield. How vital would that have been to be able to transport that not only to hospitals in need to help those soldiers coming in from the battlefield, but to actually provide it on the battlefield itself when it was probably needed the most, in the most urgent instance. I think you'll all agree with me in saying that as cool as his work and his innovations within the, the realm of sound and cinema were, as cool as that is, his invention of the portable cooling unit that could be stored in trucks it was a it was a life saver. It's a life saving invention in every sense of the word, and that I think is ultimately where the legacy of Frederick Jones should be. His work, his ideas, his inventions helped save lives. Because if you think about it, it's not just a case of saving lives for soldiers coming into base hospitals. It's saving lives on the battlefield. It's providing provisions, medicine, equipment that is needed instantly. Just amazing. On a side note, if this particular part of the episode has really interested you, this, this invention that helped massively during the Second World War campaign, then you really need to check out, if you are unfamiliar with that, is Charles Richard Drew. I wanted to include him, but again, I wanted to consolidate the episode I didn't have enough time to fit everyone in, but yeah, if you were interested in inventions that really sort of spearheaded change and made a huge difference during World War II, check out the work of Charles Richard Drew with his work on blood banks and blood plasma programs. But yeah, him and the portable cooling unit brought from Frederick, life-saving inventions, life-saving work. So now we're going to get into some pioneering African-American women. And we're going to start with two quick but very much needed honourable mentions. And they belong to, first and foremost, Judy W. Reed. Judy was alive during the 1880s and whose only record is known from a US patent. The patent in question was issued on September the 23rd, 1884 and was for an improved design of a dough kneader and roller. It's unknown if Judy was actually able to read or write or even sign her own name because where the signature should have gone for the patent, there is simply an X. And there's possible reasons for this. It could be that she couldn't read, write, or sign her name. But the sad and, and kind of just gut-churning possibility that the reason she only signed an X is because at the time, it was illegal for any slaves to be literate. And those who were found reading, writing, or teaching others to do so could be punished severely or killed. So... It could be a case that Judy, in an effort to take credit for her idea, but at the same time keep herself from being punished or possibly killed, didn't put her name to it, didn't put her signature to it, which is just, yeah. The first African-American woman who had a fully signed patent in her name was Sarah Elizabeth Good, and she basically got a patent 
1885, and it was for a design for a folding bed, a sort of precursor to the Murphy bed. This came about because of housing restrictions within New York City. I think, in general, tenement buildings back then had a footprint of about 25 feet by 100 feet. So environments like that, every square inch was was crucial, and saving space was essential. It may not be the most crucial, the the most life-changing invention mentioned in this episode, but I just felt that Sarah Elizabeth Good and Judy W. Reed had to be mentioned. You know, they were the first recorded two African-American women to receive U.S. patents. You know, they were the, the first to go. They were the first to be given the green light, the first to put ideas into action. And, yeah, it just, it just felt right to give them an honourable mention. I've got one more honourable mention to do before we jump into the main four profiles, and it is for the fantastic Shirley Ann Jackson. If you have any interest in science and you're unfamiliar with her work, go check her out. Hopefully this is going to entice you, but for those of you who don't know, Shirley Ann Jackson was the second African-American woman in the US to earn a doctorate in physics. She was the very first African-American woman to have earned said doctorate at MIT. Outside of this, Shirley Ann Jackson was just an absolute wizard in the field of condensed matter, the rightful recipient of numerous distinctions, and honestly, for anyone listening with an interest in science, particularly the field of physics, or if you have kids who are aspiring to work in the field of science, if you have kids that are interested in science, then yeah, dig deeper into the life and the prestigious career of Shirley Ann Jackson. The hurdles she faced and the triumphs her hard work, intellect and desire awarded her truly are something else. So yeah, if you've got an interest in science and particularly physics, or if your kids are showing an interest in science and they are wanting to find out about pioneers in that field, particularly physics, Shirley Ann Jackson, check her out. You will not be disappointed. So our first featured female in this episode is a woman called Mary Kenner, who was born 17th of May, 1912 in North Carolina. And the first interesting thing about Mary straight off the bat is that Mary came from an entire family of inventors. So we start two generations before Mary and we unfortunately start with a theme that continues throughout the family's history of invention. So Mary's grandfather invented a light signal for trains. However, that invention was stolen from him, so he never got to patent it, and he never got to make any money from it. Mary's father was a keen inventor too, he invented a whole bunch of things, one of which was a clothing press that could fit into a suitcase, but unfortunately he didn't make any money from that one either. But he did invent a bunch of other items, mainly a window washer for trains, and a ambulance trolley with wheels, a gurney. And if you think about it, what a life-saving invention that is taking somebody from an incident to the ambulance, from the ambulance to the emergency room. So much easier, so much quicker with a trolley with wheels. You think about that. We're talking seconds, sure. But in certain situations, those seconds can be vital. And that is a hell of an invention to have your name attached to. Her sister Mildred was also an inventor, and she would go on to invent a board game called Family Tradition, a game that was manufactured in various fashions, including, and get this, Get how cool this is, a braille version. I mean, it's already pretty amazing that you've invented a board game that is being mass manufactured and published. But to have a version of it done in braille so people with vision impairment can play? Oh, even better. What's kind of cool is that Mary and Mildred would actually work together on certain things and come up with certain inventions as a team. So in 1982, at the age of 70, Mary, alongside her sister Mildred, would go on to hold a joint patent for the toilet roll holder. That deserves some recognition for sure, and at the age of 70 as well. She's inventing stuff at 70, but even even better than that, at the age of 75 in 1987, Mary held the patent for a backwasher that you could mount to a shower or a bathtub wall. At 75, she's still making things that are of great convenience to everybody. That is... Kudos, Mary. But as great as that was... 
Mary Kenner's most revolutionary invention came decades earlier. In 1956 or 57, it's one or the other. I have actually read it as, as both. So, because I'm not entirely sure, I'm going to say either or. So it's either 56 or 57, but it was one of them. Anyway, in 56 or 57, having worked a number of odd jobs and saved up enough money, Mary applied for her first patent. Said patent was for the sanitary belt, an elastic belt which held cloths and rags in place. Because back then, that's what women were using, cloths and rags. And they were having to not only endure everything that goes on at that point, but they were having to manually apply and discard cloths and rags. So you had the inconvenience factor as well as everything else. And then comes along the sanitary belt. And then three years later, Mary improved her invention and created a moisture-resistant pocket. Now, a revolution like that you think would catch on like wildfire, right? I mean, you're talking about changing the game significantly. Unfortunately, it didn't play out like that. The Song Nat Pack Company did show initial interest in purchasing Mary's invention, but after finding out that Mary Kenner was black, they pulled out of the deal. Now, this is bad enough, but there's another tragic twist to this story, because eventually Mary's patent would expire and become public domain, which of course allowed anybody and everybody to manufacture it at will without giving Mary a single penny. You know, it's sickening to think that anybody is, is denied what is rightfully theirs to begin with. But considering what we're talking about here, considering we're talking about something that was a huge, huge step forward for the hygiene and safety and just general comfort and convenience of women everywhere, it's, it's crazy. But regardless, Mary will always be credited for that. She will always have her name attached to it. She will always be responsible for making something that changed the lives of women everywhere. If you've ever used one of those little fish IP poles you get indoors, whether it's in your own home or whether it's in a hotel room, you've maybe ordered room service and you just look through the little peephole to see if it's who you're expecting, if you've ever buzzed somebody up to your apartment via an intercom, or if you have one of those fancy home security systems in place, then you have Marie Van Britten Brown to thank for that. Whilst working as a nurse and living in Queens, New York during the 1960s, Marie would, as nurses often do, work unconventional hours. And she was concerned about and inspired eventually by the crime rate and the slow response time to the police in her neighbourhood. This, alongside her husband, led Marie to invent the first home security system. If you're thinking this may be a sort of very primitive system, or you're just wondering how it looked, then, yeah, I'm going to walk you through it. All right, so this is the initial system. There were three peepholes placed on the front door at different height levels. There was a, one at the top for tall people, so one at the bottom for kids, and then there was one in the middle for anyone of about average height. On the other side of the door, there was a camera, which was attached, and it had the ability to slide up and down to allow the person to see through each peephole. The camera picked up images, and they would be reflected to a monitor, via a wireless system. The monitor could be placed in any part of the house to allow you to see who was at the door. Added to this, there was also a voice component which enabled you to speak to the person outside the door. If the person was someone you were expecting, or a welcome visitor, you could unlock the door via a remote control. If they weren't, if they were an intruder or you felt threatened, then via the push of a button, you could notify the police. So for the very first home security system, that is quite the elaborate and efficient setup. So on August 1st, 1966, both Marie and Albert Brown filed for a patent under the title Home Security System Utilising Television Surveillance. Not exactly the snappiest title, but who am I to criticise? I didn't invent the home security system. I'm just an idiot talking about it. Their application for this was approved on December the 2nd, 1969, and they became the inventors of the home security system, which obviously has gone on to great success, 
and it has since grown outside of domestic use and has, as I said, kind of become the blueprint for surveillance and security in general. In fact, according to a 2016 New Scientist report, 100 million concealed closed-circuit cameras are now in operation worldwide. That was back then. In 2016, you can only imagine there's been more installed and are active. So yeah, each one. Each single one has grown from the acorn of ingenious that was Marie Van Britten Brown and her husband Albert's very first home security system. Our penultimate featured inventor is also a fellow New York native and she goes by the name of Patricia Ira Beth. Born in Harlem on the 4th of November 1942, Patricia Beth would become an ophthalmologist, laser scientist, innovative research scientist, advocate for blindness prevention, treatment and cure, the first female member of the Jules Stein Eye Institute, the first woman to lead a postgraduate training program in ophthalmology and the first woman elected to the honorary staff of the UCLA Medical Center. So it's pretty safe to say that Patricia did quite well for herself. After excelling in her studies at high school and university, earning awards for scientific research as early as age 16, Patricia embarked on a career in medicine. She received her medical degree from Howard University College of Medicine in Washington, D.C., before she interned at Harlem Hospital from 1968 to 69. During which, and on a side note, uh, aside from these incredible achievements, following the assassination of Martin Luther King in 68, Patricia dedicated herself to achieving one of Dr. King's dreams, namely the empowerment of people through the Poor People's Campaign. She organised and led Howard University medical students in providing volunteer healthcare services to the Poor People's Campaign in Resurrection City in the summer of 68. So not only was she making great academic strides and, and obtaining knowledge and pursuing her particular field of science and medicine, but she was using what she was learning, she was using the things she was picking up in her academic journey to help other people, specifically people in need. There's just, you know, there's, there's a great sense of awe about anybody that can better themselves, that can move towards uh, progression within themselves, but there's, there's just that extra layer added when they're using the things they're learning to help other people like she did here. As an intern shuttling between Harlem Hospital and Columbia University, Patricia was quick to observe that at the eye clinic in Harlem, half the patients were blind or visually impaired. At the eye clinic at Columbia, by contrast, there were very few obviously blind patients. It was this observation that led her to conduct a retrospective study that documented that blindness among blacks was double that among whites. She reached the conclusion that the, the high prevalence of blindness within the black community was simply due to lack of access to the necessary and needed care. And as a result, she proposed a new discipline which became known as community ophthalmology, which is now operative worldwide. And community ophthalmology basically combines aspects of public health, community medicine and clinical ophthalmology to offer primary care to those that are in the underserved populations. So through her research, she discovered that there were communities that just simply weren't getting the due care and attention needed to maintain and preserve healthy eyesight. So she implemented a system that provided the care and attention that those that weren't getting it needed. Volunteers trained as eye workers and would visit senior centres and daycare programmes to test vision and screen for cataracts, glaucoma and other threatening eye conditions. This outreach has saved the sight of thousands whose problems would have otherwise gone undiagnosed and more to the point, untreated. By identifying children who need eyeglasses, the volunteers have given these children a better chance at success in school. So you are looking at a system that has had a prolonged, profound knock-on effect. Outside of this, Patricia was also instrumental in bringing surgical services to Harlem Hospital's eye clinic, which did not perform eye surgery in 1968. She persuaded her professors at Columbia to operate on blind patients for free, and she volunteered as an assistant surgeon. The first major eye operation at Harlem Hospital was performed in 1970 as a result of her efforts. Despite her excellent work and the clear advances within her field, 
Dr. Patricia Baff did experience a number of obstacles. She experienced numerous instances of sexism and racism, particularly through her tenure at both UCLA and the Charles R. Drew University. But this didn't deter her. Determined that her scientific endeavours would not be instructed by glass ceilings in the US, she decided to take her research abroad to Europe. Her work was accepted on its merits at the Laser Medical Centre of Berlin in West Germany, the Rothschild Eye Institute of Paris in France, and the Loughborough Institute of Technology in England. And it was at these institutions that she achieved her personal best in research and laser science, the fruits of which are now evidenced by her laser patents on eye surgery. And it's her work within this particular field which has left her to make a truly indelible mark on history. Her interest, experience and research on cataracts led her to the invention of a new device and method to remove cataracts. That device is called the laser phaco probe. Now at the time that she conceived the idea for this, back in 1981, her idea was more advanced than technology was at the time. And so it took a little bit of time to actually become realised. In fact, it took her nearly five years to complete the research and testing needed to make it work. But when she did, and she got the patent for it, and it became an actual thing, when it became fully realised, it became a game changer. Check this out. This is staggering. Through her work in this particular project and field, Dr. Patricia Beth was able to recover the sight of several individuals who had been blind for over 30 years years. For the final innovator on our list, we're going to jump forward in time a little bit. Born in 1955 in Pennsylvania, Marion R. Croke has made significant contributions to the advancement of modern technology, especially in the field of voice over internet protocol, or VoIP, for those of us who like a good acronym. After completing her doctoral studies at the University of Southern California in 1982, Marion joined AT&T at Bell Labs, which, for those of you who don't know, which before this was very much me, Bell Labs is a prestigious research and scientific development company that is owned by Finnish telecoms company Nokia, or as some people here call it, Nokia. Is it Nokia? I don't know, actually. Nokia sounds more Scandinavian. I've always known it as Nokia, but anyway, yes, it's owned by Nokia. The very same Nokia that gave us the illustrious 3210, complete with the always and ever endearing game Snake, which is arguably still one of the most addictive time vacuums in technological history. Fun fact on the side here for you before we get into this. The Bell's Lab. Let's get this, nine Nobel Prizes have been awarded for work completed at Bell Labs. So it's not like Marion went to some rinky-dink slouch of a tech place. We're talking top-of-the-class stuff here. Anyway, I'm getting slightly sidetracked. So throughout her career, Marion worked her way up the ladder with AT&T at Bell Labs, and among her positions, she held the title of Vice President of the Services Network in R&D, Research and Development. And it was here that she was responsible for over 200 programs dealing with AT&T's wireline and wireless services. She was also supervisor to over 500 world-class engineers and computer scientists. She was then promoted to the rank of AT&T Senior Vice President of Applications and Services Infrastructure. It's a long title, but it's an important one. With this title, her responsibilities grew to supervise over 2,000 computer scientists and engineers. 2,000 is a lot of anything, but 2,000 computer scientists and engineers that you are supervising and helping push forward with initiatives that are changing the parameters of modern technology, it's a lot of responsibility. But it's also a, a, just, a, a testament to obviously how good you are at what you're doing. During this time, she not only mentored her staff, but she was also in charge of development, testing, service planning, and product realization. So she wasn't just giving orders. She wasn't just a pencil pusher. She was very hands-on. She was clearly a woman that was involved, wanted to be involved, and was in every initiative and application that she oversaw. Furthermore, as an individual... Dr. Marion Croke has obtained hundreds of patents through her career. Now, I've found various different numbers saying it's this many and that many, so I don't have an exact number, but whatever the precise total is, we're talking in the hundreds. The hundreds, hundreds of patents, which is ridiculous. One of, if not 
The most significant patent in her career is for text-based donations, which was awarded back in 2005. Five years later, this breakthrough allowed at least $22 million to be pledged towards helping Haiti after the country suffered that catastrophic earthquake. A text-to-donate program that Dr. Marion Croak had invented, patented and distributed helped raise $22 million from texts. Think of that for a second. Not only did she create a revolutionary pipeline through technology, but her ideas and the implementation of said ideas in one singular instance, that's one of her hundreds of patents, has done so much for the world of fundraising and philanthropy. So it's not just a case of this woman has helped advance technology and the way that the public can use technology for good. It's helped charitable work, it's helped philanthropy, it's helped good causes receive the funds they need, as well as being a technological leap forward. In 2014, she left AT&T and joined Google, where during her time there, she has led the deployment of Wi-Fi across India's railroad system and had a major contributing hand in a project called Project Loon. Now, essentially, Project Loon is a series of hot air balloons, essentially, but a condensed version that can create aerial wireless networks for people that live out in rural and remote networks. So yeah, a series of high altitude balloons that provide internet access. So if you are out in the sticks and recently your internet has improved, you may actually have Dr. Marion Croak and her team to thank for that. brings us to the end of this investigative journey of sorts. I have really enjoyed digging through so many things of research to put this together. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I hope that the little condensed biographies, the little bits of information, the sort of amuse-bouche of history that I've presented within this 60 Minutes has has given you the, the desire to go and find out more. Because there is so much more to find out. I am just giving you a little glimpse into the life and achievements of these incredible people. I'm just giving you a little taste of how it is that they have made major leaps in science, technology, and just general day-to-day -day living. Hopefully it's made you want to go and find out more about the people mentioned in this episode, but also more about people you didn't know or don't know about. Because that's the thing. There are so many inventors, there are so many innovators in different fields, in different walks of life that have been not so much ignored, but not publicised, not provided to people as broadly and as publicly as they could and should have been. Now, what I mean by this is I'm not saying that I'm uncovering hidden gems. I'm not digging into complete obscure figures throughout history. Of course, people know about everyone we've mentioned here. Of course. But maybe not enough people. I certainly didn't until I did this. So, if nothing else, if nobody other than me gets something from this, I'm perfectly fine with that because I've learned some stuff. Hopefully you guys have too, and as I say, hopefully it has kind of inspired you to find out more. But that's what we should be doing, right? I mean, if we want to get better as individuals, if we want to get better as a nation, if we want to get better as a species, we need to be educating ourselves and we need to be encouraging other people to educate themselves too. We need to be sharing, we need to be growing. And I think something as simple as this, as digging into a subject you didn't know about and learning about it can have an amazing impact on individuals, in communities, in nations, and again, just as a species. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find some stuff out for me and take everything I can from it and share a little bit with you guys and, and vice versa. This is the thing. If you have inventors, if there's people on here that should have been included, if I've omitted people and it's just driving you crazy, you're like, oh, but what about so-and-so? And I do realise I missed Charles R. Drew off here. He was on my shortlist, but again, I wanted to condense it. I know that there are people I've missed off because it's, it's just impossible to cover everyone. But if you have people that you would suggest I go check out, please, please, please let me know who you think I should go check out, who you would recommend I dig deep into the history of, because I want to know. That's the thing I want to know. So let me know. Give me your suggestions. Give me your ideas. Tell me what I've missed. 
tell me what you think I would be interested in. Because again, that's it. That's the beauty of it, right? That's the beauty of communication. It's sharing is growing. Is advancing ourselves and each other. That's how we become better, right, guys? Education and empathy, the two E's. Anyway, I am going to wrap this up, but first I am going to go through some of my reference points as I talked about earlier. Again, if you want to find clickable links so you can go and do your own online digging through these rabbit holes of history, then head out to the website, dimed-out.com. Look for this episode, and if you look down into the show notes, there will be clickable links for the following reference points that I have used. And these are the main sources I've used to put this together. And they are as follows. Biography.com, history.com, always a good one. Black Past, Good Black News, CFM Medicine, Women in Technology Hall of Fame. Those have been my five major reference points for this episode. But again, if you want to go dig in through those yourself, you can find them in the show notes for this episode over at dimed out. Dot com. Before I finally wrap this episode up, I also need to give a quick shout out to Scott Buckley. Scott is the uber-talented musician responsible for all the music you've heard in this episode. So all those little transitional compositions, they are Scott's handiwork. If you've enjoyed them, which rightfully you should have because they're all beautiful and lovely, then you can find out more um, about Scott and you can hear those in full. What I'm going to do is on the show notes... Again, over at dimed-out.com, I'm going to put a link to Scott's YouTube page, and I'm also going to make a playlist of all the tracks featured in this episode so you can hear them in their full glory. So yeah, once again, shout out to Scott Buckley for the beautiful, beautiful music used throughout this episode. Other than that, just to give you a little sort of preview for the next coming weeks, it's going to have some guests. The next two episodes for sure are going to have some guests, so yeah, you're going to hear someone else's voice instead of just mine, which I'm sure you will be over the moon about. Um, I'm not going to tell you what's coming up in the shows, I'm not going to tell you what's going to be discussed and chopped up, it's going to be a surprise, but I can tell you that both episodes are going to be great to absolutely steal a catchphrase from an animated tiger. Until they drop though, if you really want to help out here, other than listening and being supportive, which you guys always, always are, if you want to go just a little bit extra with that support, then you can give me a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are getting this from, because that's the thing. We're available pretty much anywhere. I am pretty much a podcast sleut at this point. You can find me anywhere. So, yeah, ratings and reviews really do help, not only with my self-esteem, but with the algorithms and, and, and the rankings and, and all those internet gubbins too. So, yeah, if you want to help, um, that's the best way you can do so. If you want to get in touch with me about the show with suggestions, recommendations, topic ideas for future episodes, or maybe you've got some music you want to contribute to the show, I don't know. Whatever it is, even if you just want to swing by and say, hey, I didn't particularly care for that episode so much. Whatever it is, as long as you're nice about it, you can do so. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at I am Mal Foster, or you can find the Dimed Out Facebook page if people are still using Facebook. Um, yeah, it's there. You can do that. But Twitter is probably the best place to find me. Other than that, this is it. This is the end of the episode. I promise. I'm going to leave you to it now. I just want to say thank you as always for listening. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a pleasure doing these and it's a pleasure knowing that you guys are getting something from it. At least I hope you're getting something from it. That's all I can ever hope. But um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for being on this journey with me so far. And I hope to see you as we go further down the road and dig into more interesting stuff. But until next time, look after yourself and those around you and keep it dimed out. Mm-hmm.